Ruchem Aboyim. Thank you for coming. Today is the eleventh um, lecture on our, on our series of Gematrias, numerical values and words, and how we deal with them. And we're up to the letter Tet, the ninth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's interesting that Tet is the least common letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Again, it has a numerical value of nine. Uh, nine is the last of a single digits. It is the highest sum of individual parts. Man's role in creation is to be a shutif, a partner with God, by turning from nine to ten. The full term of a fetus's development in the womb is nine months. Gestation is a period of expectation. It is a developmental process, one which, like the number nine, involves turning towards delivery, a higher state of completion, and this is ultimately reached in the birth of a newborn child. Now, the passage from life inside the womb to the outside has a na its natural parallel in the transfer from this world to the world to come. The world to come was created, our rabbis tell us, but with a yud, the tenth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, as a mark of completion. So nine marks the space in which man operates his life's mission, turning towards ten in a state of completion to pass into a higher dimension. The first tet that appears in the Torah is in the word tov, which means good, which is found in Bereshit, chapter 1, verse number 4. This shows that the letter tet is a general symbol for goodness. Teshuvah, repentance, too is called tov, because it allows a man an opportunity to convert his misdeeds into merits. The letter Tet, like many other letters in a Torah scroll, has tiny crowns that extend from them. What is unusual about this first Tet that's found in the Torah is that it has four crowns instead of the usual three. According to the Bnei Yisachar, when the four is multiplied by the number nine, the value of, of the total is 36. 36 is twice the gemachi of the word Chai, life, alluding to a good life in this world and in the next. Now, the Gemara in Shabbos states that we are told that God manifests himself as a tov umetiv, the good one who does good. Our human concept of good is subjective because we are limited in our outlook and we cannot foresee the future. Many times we are attracted to things that are really detrimental to ourselves. And therefore, when we express the wish and we bless someone and say, may God fulfill all the wishes of your heart, we add the word letova. Why? Because we want for objective good. As we learn from Nachum Ish Gamzu, whom the Talmud says was given the name Ish Gamzu, a man of that good, because whatever would happen to him, he would say, Gamzu Tova, that this too is for good, regardless of what it was. Again, there's a story, but I don't want to take up time with it. In Mishle, in chapter 4, verse number 2, it says, Ki tov nosati lachem, for a great acquisition I have given to you. And the next word after lachem is, Torasi, my Torah. The word Tov has a gematria, a numerical value of 17. The 17th sedra in the Torah is Yitro, where we read about the giving of the Torah to the children of Israel. We read that there were nine para adumas, the red heifers, the first brought by Moshe in the desert, the second by Ezra at the beginning of the second temple era, and the remaining seven during the span of 420 years that the second temple stood. Also, nine times we know that the children of Israel were counted. The tenth will be with the coming of Mashiach. May he come quickly in our time. Now, in the first set of tablets, Luchot, every letter of the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet appears except the letter Tet. However, in the second set of tablets, the Tet appears in the fifth commandment, where it says, Ulaman Yitov Lach, which translates to me, so it will go well with you. And the rabbis explain, it was known to God Almighty that the first set of tablets would be broken by Moshe. Had they contained the word tov, then the world would have feared 
that the breaking of the Luchot, of the tablets, signified that all tov, all goodness on earth had come to an end. So in order to spare mankind this anxiety, God omitted the Tet, based on the Gemara and Bavakama. Among all the letters in the names of the tribes, there is no Chet and no Tet, which spells the word Chet, sin. This teaches us that all of Yaakov's sons were sinless and fulfilled the Torah. When Moshe Rabbeinu was born, the Torah says that she saw Ki Tovhu, that he was good. Now the word Tov is crowned with five tagin, five crowns, symbolizing that the infant Moshe was destined to transmit the five books of the Torah to the children of Israel, based on a Balaturim. One of Moshe's names, in fact, was Tuvia. Now the Maral of Prague explains that the name Tuvia consists of two words, the word Tov and the word Ka, the Yud and the He, a name of God of severity. According to the Arizal, the letter Tet is a combination of two letters of the Hebrew alphabet, the Chaf and, and the Vav. And uh, Chaf and Vav have numerical value of 20 and 6, again, numerical value of 26, alluding to the name of God that we don't say, the God of special name, the God's name of mercy, Yudke Vavke. The Osius Rabbi Akiva say that the letter Tet symbolizes humility. Its right side portrays a man bending his head in humility before God in prayer and thanks, symbolized by the straight left side, the highest authority. We have a belief that God holds the keys to four blessings himself. This is alluded to by the word mafteach, which means key. This is an acronym, the mem, fe, tof, and chet. The mem stands for motor, rain, the pe, parnosa, a livelihood, financial success. The tof, tchiest hamesim, revival of the dead. And the chet for chaya, which is the time of birth. Success is God's. We see that the ninth request in the weekday Shmon Esrei, the Amida, is asking God for, for material success. The Gemara in Bava Metzia states that a person would rather have one kav of his own wheat the nine kavim of his neighbor's wheat. Again, this blessing. The letter Ted is found in the word get, which means divorce. The word get is not found in biblical Hebrew, but was adopted in Talmudic times as the name of a Jewish divorce document. The Shulchan Aruch states that the word get is related to a stone called the gita, which erodes and disintegrates all stones that are close to it base in heaven or Ezer. Now, the Vilna Gon, the Gron, made an ingenious observation. And he says that in the entire Torah, the two letters Gimel and Tet are never found next to each other, <clears throat> neither within one word, not even at the last and first letter of adjacent words. Since these letters are always separated from each other, they are an appropriate title for an instrument that separates husband and wife from each other, based on the Bar Eliyahu. Every letter in the alphabet, the Hebrew olive bet, is found large and small somewhere in the Torah. In the book of Echa, we read, Tavu Ba'eretz Sharea, that her, meaning Jerusalem's gates, are sunk into the ground. In this verse, the tet is written small. This alludes to the ninth of Av the day on which both the first and simple second temples were destroyed, based on the Messiah's Habris HaGadol. Then Kohelet, chapter 7, verse number 1, it states, Tov Shem Mishem and Tov. A good name is better than good oil. The Tet in the first word Tov is enlarged to emphasize that a good reputation built on a person's virtue and character outweighs any accumulation of riches. A man's good name endures long after his material wealth has disappeared. Based on Kohelet Rabbah. The ninth Sfirot out of the ten that God used to create the world is Yisod, foundation. It pours its blessing into the tenth Sfirah, 
which is malchut, kingship. This attribute symbolizes peace. Peace is the only vessel capable of containing blessings, as our rabbis teach us. The Holy One, blessed be he, found no vessel that could hold blessings for Israel other than peace. As we see that many of our most precious prayers end with the word shalom, peace. The Kaddish, the Amida, Birchat Koanim, the priestly blessing, and the Birchat Hamazon, the grace after meal. There are nine sacrifices that are mentioned. An usham, a guilt offering, a mincha, a meal offering, a chatos, a sin offering, an ola, a burnt offering, Pesach, the korban Pesach that we bring, a maaser behema, uh, maaser bechor, the uh, bringing of the first of the animals, shlamim, a peace offering, and miluim, an induction sacrifice, corresponding to the nine words in the wor in the verse, hanochi Hashem alokecha. I am the Lord your God, Asher Jose Sicha Meir Tzrayim, who took you out of the land of Egypt, the base avodim from the house of servitude. Now, Rosh Hashanah is described in the liturgy as Hayom Harat Olam, that today the world was conceived, alluding to the nine months of gestation before, with, beginning with conception, and concluding with the birth of a newborn child. It was on Rosh Hashanah that God answered the heartfelt prayers of three women. It, it, uh, it was, on, pardon me, the Torah reading of the day on Rosh Hashanah recounts that the old and barren Sarah miraculously conceived Yitzchak. The Haftorah relates that Chana's prayers were also answered on Rosh Hashanah, and she conceived the Navi, the prophet Shmuel, Samuel. The nine times that God's name is mentioned in Chana's prayers is mirrored in the structure of the special Musaf prayer that is composed of nine blessings. This parallels to the nine months when the fetus develops in the womb. The conception of Rosh Hashanah on the first day of Tishrei turns towards Yom Kippur, the tenth of Tishrei, nine days later, with the rebirth of a bali tshuva, of a repentant man, as pure and innocent as a newborn baby. Rachel's prayers were also answered on this day. Together, the names of these three women possess nine letters. The blowing of the shofar also relates to the number nine as the minimum requirement that one must hear blown on Rosh Hashanah. Three sets of three sounds of tekiah, tetrua, tekiah. The duration of the blast must be at least nine beats. The Shekhinah, God's divinity, is characterized by the communal integration of ten. The descent of the Shekhinah from above stays at a height of ten handbreadths above the ground. It does not go below this point. So the regression from ten down to nine conveys the loss of that Shekhinah that is not present in the first nine handbreadths above the ground. The most tragic application in the reversal from ten to nine was witnessed on Tisha B'Av. On this day was the departure of the Shekhinah, the divine presence from the temples and the subsequent destruction of the temples and Jerusalem, which culminated in the exile of the nation. The word Tisha, nine, also, also connected to Pesach Haggadah, with the question, who knows nine? The answer given is the nine months of pregnancy. Again, this connects to Tisha B'Av, and that we have a tradition. Mashiach, our Redeemer, will be born on Tisha B'Av. So the day of our greatest tragedies is also the day that begins our greatest salvation, both connected to nine. This connection between the number nine and ten we see in the Talmud in Kedushan, where it mentions nine out of ten measures. These include wealth taken by the Romans, poverty by the Babylonians, arrogance by Elam, might by the Persian, lice by Media, witchcraft by the Egyptians, disease by pigs, promiscuity by the Arabs, brazenness by Meshan, drunkenness by the Ethiopians, and sleep by slaves. There are also nine openings in the body of a male. Two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, one mouth, and two openings for excretion. With a female who was created from man's body, and who was called Ateret Bala, the crown of her husband, there is one additional opening from which she brings forth life into the world, 
connected to the tenth sphere of Malchut, kingship. In a Sefer Torah, there are chapters that are opened and closed. An open chapter is recognized by an open space from the last letter of a sentence <clears throat> to the end of the line. A closed chapter is recognized by a space opening of nine spaces in the middle of the line. We have what's called Mispar, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Mispar Cotton. Mispar Cotton is a form of gematria that pursues the root of an idea by reducing a gematria to a number less than 10. This form of gematria is called small values, mispar cotton, with all tens and hundreds reduced to one through nine by summing the digits. We then add the sum total of numbers and find a new words and meanings. For example, the word emet, truth, has a numerical value of 441. Then we take four, four and one, add them together as nine. Truth never changes. It remains constant from beginning to the end. So the letters of the word emet, the aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the mem, the middle letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and the tuf, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. All of these letters stand on two feet, in contrast to the word sheker, which is falsehood, where each of the letters, the shin, the kuf, and the resh, all stand on only one leg. An interesting fact about the number nine is that it always remains nine, no matter what number you multiply it by. For example, two times nine is 18, one and eight is nine. Five times nine is 45, four and five is nine. And you can do this all the way through. Then you'll find that no matter what number you multiply nine two times, it'll always come back to nine. Truth never changes. The first three words of creation are Bereshit bara elokim, and if you, in the beginning, God created. If you take the last letters, letter of these three words, they spell the word emet, truth. The last three words of creation are, are, are bara elokim la sot, that God created to do. If you take the last letter of these three words, they too spell the word emet, truth. We believe that one of God's names is emet. So God has signed his name to the beginning and end of creation and testified this is a world of truth. Both of them, again, with the number nine. Now the Talmud teaches us <clears throat> that whoever prays on the eve of the Shabbat and recites, Vayachulu, and the heavens and the earth were completed, it is as if he is a partner with God in the act of creation. It is noteworthy that the word Vayachulu has a gematri of 72. So the Misbar Kutten has a numerical of 7 and 2 is 9. Shabbat has a numerical value of 702. Misbar Kutten, 7 and 2 again, 9. Adam, man, has a gematria of 45. And the Misbar Kutten, 4 and 5, again, 9. And the word emet, truth, again, 441. And a Misbar Kutten of 9. So one who, who, receive, who recites by Yahulu, and it was completed on Friday night, is testifying to the truth that God Almighty created Adam and the whole world in six days, and on the seventh day, the Shabbat, he rested. May God bless you and yours with true blessings that never end. God bless and be well. Shabbat Shalom.